Welcome to Alchemical Science. I'm Jordan, an open source researcher who investigates science that's usually either very new, very old, or very esoteric. I wrote another script for this video originally, but after a few days of heavy study, I've scrapped the original plan and decided we need to spend a little more time building a comprehensive picture of each little element in the plasmoid unification model. The pieces of the puzzle are falling together for me, and I repeat, this thing is incredible. Nikola Tesla famously proclaimed that we should consider all things in terms of resonance or vibration. The Greek philosophers said that the planets cycled rhythmically in perfect harmony with one another and the cosmos, a concept labeled as the music of the spheres. All ancient cultures tended to agree on that, really. The Indians, Egyptians, Mayan, Chinese, and pretty much every other known culture in the past employed complex systems of astronomy and mathematics in their architecture, design, and art. They've left it transparently encoded for us in structures like the pyramids and the great temples. Through the work of pioneering modern researchers like Malcolm Bendel, Randall Carlson, and many, many, many others, we can now clearly see the relations between our ancient architecture and the cosmos, and it's undeniable that our predecessors held the key to advanced knowledge and technology. I personally believe this master key has already been returned to us, not suddenly in some kind of conspiracy level outbreak of new knowledge, but slowly over the least a thousand years by thousands of people who've taken up the quest. It's only that all too often we so quickly forget what the scientists of the past left us and we ignore what the scientists of the present are now offering us and we can't see the forest for the trees. This has been building up to the final stretch of the race for years and I'm calling it now. It's here. The quest to restore the holy grail of science. This begins to explain the fractal cosmic relationships between all things in our galaxy and we can find all of it condensed into Malcolm Bendel's plasmoid unification model. I'll reference everyone's work who I'm drawing from and send you to their respective sites and channels for more resources in the description as usual. So let's choose the diameters of the sun, the moon, and the earth, and the distance between them in miles is our starting point to explain all of this again. We've spoken about them briefly in part one of the plasmoid unification model series. The full precession of the equinox, one full cosmic cycle, occurs every 25,920 years. The naked eye planets all occupy exactly the same positions in the sky as they did at the beginning of the cycle, and we call this the Great Year. The diameter of the Sun is 864,000 miles, and it has a radius of 432,000 miles. The diameter of the Moon is 2,160 miles. The uh, diameter of Earth is 7,920 miles. The average distance between the Sun and the Earth is 108 times 864,000 miles. The average distance between the Moon and the Earth is 108 times 2,160 miles. And then the Moon travels its own diameter of 2,160 miles every hour. In 12 hours, the number of hours represented on our historic clock face, this equals 25,920 miles. In 24 hours, this equals 51,840 miles. From this, we can see how this spatial precession of the moon over 24 hours doesn't just show us how the moon moves over 24 hours, it shows us what 24 hours is. We've just converted space and time using the same methodology that the ancients did. This is also why you'll find the 5184 numbers representing time in Malcolm's plasmoid unification model. It may not yet be clear, but if you continue to focus your attention on the ratios, the harmonic intervals occurring between the numbers, as well as the repeating numbers themselves, you should start to form a picture. If we then take out 51,840 miles that the moon travels in 24 hours, and we divide each hour by 60 minutes, we get 864 minus the zeros, the diameter of the sun again. Let's look more closely at time. If we multiply 24 hours in a day by 60 minutes in an hour, we get 1,440. We'll see on the plasmoid unification model that 144,000 represents light, or the maximum angular velocity of light in geometric terms. If we multiply 24 hours by 60 minutes by 60 seconds, we get 864,000. Diameter of the sun again, of course. So don't try and tell me this is coincidence. It, this is the music of the spheres. These are the harmonic relationships between time and space and everything else on our Earth and in our galaxy and perhaps our wider multiverse. We can see clearly why the Sumerians employed a base 60 counting system to measure time. Let's go deeper. 
If we take the great year frequency or the distance of the moon traveled uh, in 12 hours, the number of hours represented on our clock face, we now know by now it's uh, 25,920. So this is our overall metronome for time. 25,920 miles, the moon travels in 12 hours, and there are 25,920 seconds in 12 hours. As you would expect by now, 25,920 seconds is also a fancy way of saying 432 minutes. This is expanded even further on the plasmoid unification model, so I encourage you to take some time exploring it yourself. Let's jump over to music. Uh, you may have all heard of the debate over what should be the standard concert pitch used globally. Uh, a is currently tuned to 440 hertz, and the other notes are tuned harmonically to that frequency. The concert pitch used to be A432 hertz, as it has been traditionally, um, for as far as we can tell, thousands of years in many cultures. Obviously, this change is a little ominous, and it's caused fierce controversy over the years. Um, and I think you'll begin to agree with me when I say there is a large case for A432 hertz being a standard concert pitch, which has no competitor. First, we find that if we take the 25,920 great year and we divide it by 60, the base 60 counting system we've already discussed, we've established for time, we get 432. We can get this number about a billion other ways as well, but here we are showing the harmonics between two numbers we already know. For example, we could just take the radius of the sun, 432,000 miles. A equals 432. From here, our ancient musicians have already given us the answers, uh, with which we used to tune all our instruments with before arbitrarily, and with much artificial hubris switching over to 440 hertz. We know these are the correct frequencies for the notes based on a 432 hertz concert pitch, because they've always been this way, and these precise harmonic relationships are what cause all music to sound good. We can see these notes in their mathematical ratios here on this table. If we take our A equals 432 and multiply it by 1.5, which is a ratio of 3 to 2, we call this harmonic interval perfect fifth, and we'll get the note E at a frequency of 324 hertz. We can continue on finding those frequencies by multiplying the unison note, A equals 432, by the numbers in the decimal column below this, or we can divide 432 by the numbers in the decimal columns above A432, and we'll find we get the frequencies of the other notes. And we can, of course, check the musical intervals and the ratio between each note and A432 there on the table as well. If you weren't taking note and didn't see the same numbers you're seeing in the plasmoid unification model in the frequencies of the A432 musical scale, the base frequency of our musical octave, you can surely see them in this table from Stanford University, which shows you what they titled the most harmonic numbers. This screenshot is credit to Jamie Buterf, and I hope he doesn't mind me stealing it for this presentation. I give him credit for a lot of the information I'm presenting here on music, and I encourage everyone to go and watch his videos to learn more about his totally undervalued work. Stanford constructed this table simply by starting with one in the top left corner, and then forming the far left column by doubling one, and then continuing to double each number, and then forming the top row by tripling the one, and then again tripling each consecutive number. The matrix of the table is filled out by taking the sum of the first row and the first column of numbers. We find all of the frequencies for our A equals 432 concert pitch scale here as well, and we can also find pretty much all of the numbers Malcolm has again correlated in the PUM. 144, 144,000 being the angular velocity of light, 432 being the radius of the sun and the basis of our entire musical system, uh, 5184 being our metronome for time itself, set by the movement of the daily orbit of the moon around Earth. 2592, 25,920 being the great year frequency, the full precession of the equinox. I needn't go on, you can explore the rest for yourself. This table gives us a fantastic method to determine the base frequencies of our universe, starting with the number one and using just doubling and multiplication by three to flesh out all of our cosmic harmonic numbers. We can also, of course, find the musical notes represented on Malcolm's PUM, but I need to delve deeper into that myself still. While we're referencing Jamie Buterf's research, we should also note that he clearly outlines to us the links between the music of the spheres and Malcolm's plasmoid unification model, which is a visual representation thereof, and also Marco Rodin's vortex-based mathematics. Let's work backwards for a moment and delve into how all of these numbers can be derived from vortex-based maths. 
showing a direct correlation between the work of Marco Malcolm and Marco Roden. It's as simple as this. The frequencies and numbers we've talked about so far can be derived from VBM. VBM's a modernized mathematical language which underlies the construction of this harmonic frequency spectrum of our universe. The magic 396 isn't a frequency itself as it's commonly confused to be. It's instead one of the family number groups, the base code from which the A432 Hz frequency and harmonic scale is constructed from. To get there from VBM, we can take our Abha cipher and find our family number groups easily. I've got a whole video on Marco's Abha cipher, so feel free to go and check that out if you're interested. At any rate, we can derive the famous family number groups from the cipher 147, 258, and 396. Then Jamie shows us how we can find our frequencies interwoven and hidden within these deceptively simple sequences of numbers. A Dr. Paleo, who I haven't checked out myself, I've just seen Jamie reference, uh, also famously discovered these family number groups, and he published them in a book a few decades ago. And he made the mistake of using the family number groups as his direct basis to form what he believed was the harmonic musical scale, which we now know is the incorrect method, although many people still get tricked by this one, and there is tons of disinformation online. So, uh, Paleo derived the following frequencies for the Solfigio by scrambling the family number groups. Um, so 396, 417, 528, 639, 741, and 852. And Jamie claims, and he's self-evidently correct, correct in my opinion, when he says that this is an abstraction and not the correct method. Instead, the family number groups are only used as the base equation, the base code to determine the correct harmonic frequency scale, which is of course what we find fleshed out even further in the PUM. Just using Puleo's, Puleo's incorrect shuffled numbers here to give some examples, if we take 693 and we subtract 396, its opposite shifted pair, we get 243, which is 432 shifted to the right. If we take 741 and subtract 417, uh, this equals 324, which is 432 shifted two places to the right. And if we take 852 and subtract 528, its pair there, that's 324, which is 432 shifted two places to the right again. So Jamie shows us how we can derive a lot of other important frequencies and harmonic intervals from the VBM family number groups that we can find again condensed in the PUM, and this helps to form a conclusive link between the work of Malcolm and Marco. This is why Malcolm Bendel, Nikola Tesla, Marco Roden, Jamie Buterf, and so many others revere the 6, 9, and 3. These numbers are holographic fractals, and a wealth of further information can be derived from them. That's even an understatement. We can then go further backwards and see how the family number groups, the keystones of VBM, can be ascertained from the Fibonacci sequence as outlined by Tom Barnett in his videos, which I've often referenced in my own videos explaining concepts related to VBM and rodent coils. I'll link to his videos in the description and you can check out that process yourself. This video is getting pretty long so I won't repeat it unnecessarily. From here we can make the already well established jump to see how the Fibonacci sequence of numbers can be ascertained from the golden ratio, which we can find all around us, everywhere in nature, as is well documented in all fields of science. You can really see how this is truly a unification theory, right? There are some really quite astounding correlations here. Malcolm has provided some pretty next level information on this in his toroidal model of the elements, but I'm still just in the process of my own research on this, and it needs a video of its own. I'm just building the bigger picture still for now so we can continue to go deeper. If we would like to find our family number groups and the 396 again, we can look no further than the famous tarot cards. Ever wondered why all the pre-1900s books on the tarot say that the cards, which are popularly sold as a device for fortune telling, actually have a much more important secret knowledge of numbers hidden within the arrangement of the deck? We can find precisely the same sequences and families of numbers clearly hidden within the tarot, and I'll do another whole video on that at some point when I have the time, because um, it's really interesting to see how many people throughout history have realized what we're talking about here and hidden it for us in plain sight. I want to jump back to considering time and space and see if I can explain how time, space, and frequency, and music, numbers, and the ratios between the planets, and everything else we've discussed so far, can be converted into geometry uh, and the 360 degrees of the compass and the cardinal directions. And spoiler alert, I can explain it. And I'll leave you with this. 
The circumference of a circle can be partitioned into 360 degrees of arc. Each of the 360 degrees of arc can be further divided into 60 minutes of arc, just as we do with time. This equals 21,600 minutes of arc, the number of our timekeeper, the moon. Each of the 60 minutes of arc can be further divided into 1,296,000 seconds of arc, which will see noted on as our resonant frequency energy unit in seconds on the plasmoid unification model. But that's enough for this video. We'll get to the rest later this week. From geometry, we can move on to talk about ancient and modern architecture and elemental crystal forms and time being the mold in which matter forms and see where all of that leads us, all coming in part three. And I wanna thank Malcolm for everything he's given us. It's all there, we just need to unpack it. And also a big thanks to Marco Roden, who's been teaching me a whole lot and making all of this much easier. And to Jamie Buterf, who I feel has been totally overlooked and undervalued as a researcher, like so many interesting minds. Please consider subscribing to the channel or donating if you've got something from this video. I'm open source and independent, and I would love to spend more time researching and making videos. This can be achieved with your kind support. And thanks very much to those who've already given a donation as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next part.